Hello, everyone, and welcome, welcome, welcome to today's session of American English Live Series 7. Thank you so much for your patience as we were having a few technical difficulties. It's wonderful to see each and every one of you here today. So let's begin today with this fun photo featuring a viewing group in um, Chuquipata, Ecuador, participating in a session earlier in the series. We love to see our teacher participants actively engaged in professional development, so please, please continue to share your wonderful photos from AE Live sessions by emailing them to American English Webinars at FHI360.org or by sharing them on social media. If you share on social media, please tag us at American English for Educators. We may feature one of your photos during the next webinar. Today is our next to last session in American English Live Teacher Development Series 7. For the remainder of the series, we'll explore learning through professional networks and communities of practice. We hope that you'll be able to use the practical ideas we share. Speaking of the schedule, daylight savings time began in the United States last weekend. On that day, we set our clocks forward one hour. Today's session and AE Live excuse me, 7.6, the last session, will still take place at 8 a.m. and 1 p.m. Eastern time but you may find that the webinar is broadcast one hour later in your local time zone. Please use the time zone conversion link provided here to confirm your local webinar start time. This information is also on the name in the announcement section. So here's what to expect today. Each session is about 60 minutes long and is often related to an American English eTeacher Massive Open Online course or to a Teacher's Corner theme on the American English website. The presenter will present the material and I, as your host, will ask questions and make comments as well. But we really hope to hear from you, our audience, so that we can address your ideas and experiences. Please do share your thoughts using the comments feature or chat box. When our session comes to a close in about an hour, you will have an opportunity to receive a digital badge for your participation. At the end of the session, we'll share a link in the comments and at the top of this post. Click on that link and complete a short quiz about today's session. You must answer two out of three questions correctly, and once you've successfully passed your quiz, you can expect to get your badge by email from badger at badger.io in about a week. And finally, before we begin, we want to remind you that it's not too late to register for our current free self-paced massive open online course, or MOOC, using educational technology. Participants will increase their awareness of free technological tools and how to evaluate and use those tools for language learning and teaching. This course is open between February 10th and May 4th, 2020. Participants can log in and complete coursework at any time. However, you must have everything completed by May 4th in order to pass. Visit the link here for more details on how to join. And now for today's session, Teachers Working Together, a Successful Community of Practice. Best practices and innovative ideas can be shared and cultivated in a collaborative and engaging professional network called a Community of Practice, or COP. Participating in a COP can help educators gain a positive outlook towards professional development through increased autonomy, um, which means the ability to choose learning topics as well as how and when to learn. A successful COP can grow and sustain a continuous professional education mindset, especially in contexts where educators may have limited options for training and development. In this webinar, we'll define a COP, discuss its benefits, and share the successes of an ongoing COP. We're also going to examine practical steps for building um, this type of community. And now we're pleased to introduce our presenter, Mari Bodensteiner. Mari is a lecturer in the Languages Department at the University of Wisconsin-Eau Claire. Recently, she served two years in Laos as a U.S. Department of State English Language Fellow, working on the Lower Mekong Initiative Professional Communication Skills for Leaders Project and other regional professional education projects. Mari received her Master of Education degree with an emphasis in adult and higher education from Western Washington University, and having lived and worked in international settings, she strongly believes in the power of the global community. Welcome, Mari. We're so happy to have you here today. 
Hi, Kate. Thank you for that introduction. Um, I'm so excited to be here today to talk to you guys all about something I'm really passionate about, communities of practice. Um, as Kate has mentioned, I've been teaching for just over 10 years now in a variety of contexts and settings, ranging from pre-K to adult ed. Uh, and in my experience, no matter the age of the student, I continually observe teachers working together. I really enjoy working with and mentoring teachers in a collaborative environment, whether it's face-to-face -face or online. And I'm so excited to discuss communities of practice with you today. And as Kate had briefly mentioned, as I talk about communities of practice, I'll refer to them as COP. So moving on to the next slide, before we begin, I have a question for you the audience participants. What does this term mean to you, community? Yeah, what do you think, everybody? Let us know in the chats or the comments. What are some ideas that you have about the word community? What does it mean to you? What are some characteristics or ways that you might define it? Um, let us know. Let's see, Giselle says a team. Lisa says support. Miranda says a team or group. The American Corner in Djibouti says, a group of people living in the same area or working together. Nice. Carlos says, a community is a group of people with defined interests and purpose. Benjamin says, a learning group. Um, Giselle says, a community shares a common interest. Um, and Yang Zan says, society, global, uh, sort of a global residential place where people live. And Adam says, a group with similar interests and needs. So wonderful responses, everybody. Thank you so much for sharing. Yeah, thank you for your responses. I agree with a lot of what you're saying. And throughout my career, I've worked with several different communities of practices. And some of your answers are quite similar to what we can describe as a community of practice. Uh, so implementing COPs, we lessen that burden of fear and intimidation of that mandated or required professional development. And I hope by the end of this webinar, you will, uh, you'll view professional development as a positive learning experience through communities of practice. So while discussing the idea of community, we'll follow current theory and research as it relates to communities of practice, but make it applicable for us as educators. So moving on to the next slide, I'll briefly share an overview of today's webinar. Kate had briefly mentioned that again. Um, I'll define COP and identify some of those key characteristics. Talk about some steps to develop a sustainable community of practice in your own town, examine the benefits, and then share some personal experiences. So looking at the next slide, let's define community of practice. A community of practice is a persistent, sustained social network of individuals who share and develop an overlapping knowledge base, set of beliefs, values, histories, and experiences focused on a common practice or mutual enterprise. And that de definition can be a little complicated. So let's look at it in a more practical terms for us as educators. Looking at this next slide, a community of practice we can think of, a COP is a sustained group of teachers who develop a shared knowledge base focused on a common goal. So for our purposes, a sustainable group of teachers who develop a shared knowledge focused on a common goal. We're gonna come back to those three ideas throughout this webinar, a sustainable group, shared knowledge, common goal. We'll discuss the specifics of how to establish a sustainable group, shared knowledge, and create a goal in this webinar. But for now, it's important to note that COPs are not a temporary solution to professional development in your field, but rather COPs continue to grow and evolve as teachers gain more and more experience. Additionally, COPs need to adapt to the group. The definition of a COP is quite broad. It's a big definition because each COP around the world is developed to meet the needs of that specific group. So with these three ideas in mind, again, a sustainable group, shared knowledge, and a common goal, let's move on to the next slide and connect those essential elements needed in a COP. So a successful COP is founded on three essential elements, mutual engagement, a joint enterprise, and a shared repertoire. Let's break that down and look at it from the same uh, perspective as our definition. So looking at that next slide, 
we can regard joint enterprise as a term of sustainable group. In your COP, you're collectively working toward a goal through a project that you've collectively established. In terms of mutual engagement, mutual engagement, that can be explained as a common goal. All members are working towards the same idea. The common goal for a COP would look different for each group. So if we want to click ahead and so we can highlight mutual engagement, that we can think of as a common goal. And finally, that shared repertoire, that can be um, thought of as shared knowledge. You're sharing your knowledge with your group. It refers to all of the skills and knowledge and capabilities that your group brings together. Being able to share that knowledge um, can be thought of as that shared repertoire. So I want you to think again of these three essential elements, a sustainable group, a common goal, and shared knowledge. While we discuss the reasons to develop a COP and how these three essential elements are going to contribute to the success of a COP. Up next, I'm gonna talk about some of the fundamental basics of a COP before explaining the steps of how to best develop that COP. So looking at some key characteristics of a COP, the basics, um, each, each COP is really unique and designed to meet the needs of the group. Once established, your group will determine these key characteristics. So COPs can interact online or in person or a hybrid of both. So we can blend that online or face-to-face -face communication. Members determine how often they interact. Depending on the COP goals and purpose, some groups may want to meet once a month, whereas other groups may want to prefer to meet once a month. I've worked with COPs where we meet face-to-face -face once a month, but also have regular check-ins via social media, social media messaging. And doing those weekly check-ins really helped make us accountable for our progress. To clarify, there's really many critical aspects of a COP that are determined by the group or purpose. So thinking of the common goal, a shared knowledge, and a sustainable group, let's move on to the next slide. I have a question for our audience now. Which is a COP? I have two options here, and I want you to think of those three essential elements for a COP. Option A, Teachers gather on breaks or other free time to talk about the problems of the day, students, schedule changes, and additional work given. Or option B, five new teachers get together every week to identify issues and share strategies to increase student classroom participation. All right, what do you think everybody? Are you thinking the correct definition is option A or option B? I see a lot of responses coming in. Um, option A, as Mari mentioned, is teachers gathering on breaks or other free time to talk about their problems and things like that. And option B is that five new teachers get together each week to identify issues and share strategies. So I'm seeing a lot of people saying option B. So for example, Raquel, Tafinha, Akiko, Rose, um, Huey, Vivian, a lot of people, Mary Joy. I actually haven't seen any option A choices, so I think these guys are onto the right track. What do you think, Mari? I think that's right, exactly. I'm glad to see so many option Bs because it has those three essential elements that we've already discussed. There's a sustainable group because it's the same five teachers and they're regularly meeting every week. Um, they have a common goal and that goal is to increase that student participation in the classroom and they're sharing their knowledge um, by bringing different strategies to their meeting each time. Okay, so that, now that we've compared some elements and strategies to develop a COP, um, we're gonna go over how some steps to develop that COP. So there are five steps I'm gonna talk about to develop a COP. Um, and as I'm sharing these different steps, I want you to think about um, if you are familiar with a COP or what that means, please feel free to share any successes or challenges you've had or your experience with a COP um, in the chat box again. So 
overview of how to develop a COP, there's five steps towards developing a COP. The five steps include establish the core group, establish the purpose, identify goals, get organized, and learn to collaborate. I want to stress that these five steps aren't necessarily sequential or they don't need to go in order. Some of these steps may happen at the same time and also some may happen in a different order than what I have listed here. And that's okay. COPs are created to meet the needs of the group. So um, moving on, let's look at that first step, establish a core group. One question you may be thinking is who should participate in a COP? When establishing a COP, you'll want to work with a core group of participants who share a common passion or purpose. My question for audience participants, who do you think might participate in an English language teaching COP? What do you think everybody? Who would maybe participate in an English language teaching COP? And we had one quick question from Ismail and maybe anyone who maybe joined us a little bit late. Uh, just as a reminder, COP stands for Community of Practice. Community of Practice, that's what we're talking about today. Um, let's see, who could be part of an English language teaching COP? Uh, Jenny says teachers. Rose says it could be anyone that's sort of listed here on the slide. Experienced teachers, school instructors, colleagues, uh, maybe administrators, maybe even students. Um, uh, yeah, a lot of people are saying colleagues, English teachers, um, administrators. Great, wonderful responses, everybody. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, thanks. I'm seeing a lot of great uh, responses, like Kate has mentioned, um, teacher trainers, novice or new teachers, experienced teachers, teacher mentors, program administrators, curriculum developers, materials developers. Um, another question you may be thinking is how you can find those interested people to join a COP with you. There are many resources to find uh, teachers or other colleagues to join a COP. Um, if you're viewing this webinar with a group of colleagues, I think that's a great place to find a core group. There are many other available resources to find people of similar interest, starting with our own online community here, our AE Facebook for Educators page, you could post to find um, someone with common interests in the COP or community of practice. Um, two other possible resources could be like the TESOL interest section communities or IA TEFL communities. Um, but most often it's a group of teachers working together that decides it wants to form its own COP for either general purpose or professional learning. When we think of how, how to find people, you can start right in your own school and the colleagues that you work with there, um, or you could go across town and find people from another school and partner with a multiple um, institutions or colleges, or even like I said, from a conference. Um, another question I get a lot is how big a COP can be, and that really depends on the context of the group. I've worked with COPs of five participants and up to 35 participants, and there are challenges to both large and small sized COPs. You'll have to find what works best for your context. Um, moving on simultaneously while establishing your core group, you'll need to establish the purpose of your COP. So establishing the purpose of your COP, there's a few crucial or critical questions to ask yourself. What drives a community of practice to form? Maybe because of a problem in search of an answer or a professional group in search of a community interaction. Also, you'll want to ask yourself, what are the outcomes you hope to achieve from organizing a COP? And what benefits will the members get from joining? If we look back to our original example about the new teachers developing a COP, we can ask a few questions to better understand the purpose of a COP. We can ask, who is it going to be? It would be the five new teachers from our original example. What do they want to do? They want to improve their classroom te pra teaching practices, specifically to increase student engagement techniques. And what is the benefit of it? To increase student participation in the classroom. So now that we've shared how to establish a group and purpose, let's identify goals. 
In your group, you'll need to identify key practice issues that need to be achieved to meet your goals. Every member in the group is working toward a goal. In the beginning of your COP, I recommend developing a timeline and focus on how issues will be addressed within that first year. For example, of the five new teachers working together to increase student participation, we can look at a timeline in the next slide to see how they're going to accomplish that goal. The key issue that they're working on is increasing student participation. So developing a timeline, and again, in your context, you decide how often and regularly you're meeting. Um, but for example, looking at that first meeting, you can brainstorm those key issues and then select that one issue, which the five new teachers selected as an increase to student participation. The following meeting, maybe all the teachers are researching one strategy and bringing in that shared knowledge, they bring all different strategies. So now they have five new strategies to look at and try one in the classroom. It's always, remember to impor it's always important to remember to reflect on progress as you're working, sharing those successes and challenges that you're having um, as you're implementing new classroom teaching practices in your classroom. Let's move on to a few key organizational aspects to think about. There are three important areas of organization, logistics, leadership, and expectation. So again, remember, some of these items can happen simultaneously while first starting that COP. When preparing for logistics, you and your members can think about these three critical questions. How, where, and how often? How are you going to communicate? face-to-face, -face, online, or a blend of both. Think about where everyone lives and how feasible it is for you to meet face-to-face. -face. What is the preferred communication style and what is the preferred um, social media style of each participant? What is a messaging system that everyone can respond to? Also, where? If you're meeting face-to-face, -face, where will you physically meet? Does someone need to reserve a room? Who will be responsible for that? As you begin to ask and answer some of these questions, you and your members have already begun to collaborate. Also in terms of logistics, think about how often. Think about your core group and the purpose. What are you trying to achieve? With that in mind, how often you need to meet to achieve your goals. Does once a week seem reasonable or would it be better to meet once a month? Now we can think of leadership of the group. Who will be the main point of contact and facilitate meetings? That role can rotate um, throughout the COP, but it's important to clearly establish the expectations of the leader during that initial orientation. Also share expectations with your members and how you'll hold everyone accountable. Um, from my experience, some of our greatest challenges that our COP faced were completing expected work on time as we all get busy teaching. And so having those regular check-ins via social media were really helpful in being able to respond to um, everyone's questions and working together. Great. We have a really nice comment from JP Lopo who says, it's really important to define expectations, even the terms of reference and who's to do what, things like that. So. I think he agrees with you here, Mari. Great, yeah, that's great to hear. It's really important to do that. Another thing that I really recommend is having that introductory COP orientation to really um, identify all of those expectations like he had mentioned. Um, in that COP orientation, you are able to address all of these questions that we just asked. So the how, the where, the who, the what, um, and establish all of those critical guidelines. Setting these expectations at that very first meeting will hold yourself and your members accountable for the success of that COP. You're able to answer questions as a collective group. Um, and in that first meeting, you've already started to collaborate. So thinking of collaboration, let's turn to our final step, learn to collaborate. Each group, each COP group develop its own guideline for interaction. So when developing these guidelines, you can empower members to make suggestions. And the purpose of this is to foster feelings of freedom and collective learning. If collaborating online, remember to choose those tools that best meet the needs of your group. Um, and whether you realize it or not, collaboration begins during that first meeting. 
when you're initially collaborating to decide the key issues and your focus. So let's briefly review these five steps before moving on towards some of the benefits. Um, in regards to these five steps, there's a few key takeaways for successful COPs. Establishing clear communication by maximizing technology and scheduling those regular check-ins. The second is the COP orientation um, to incorporate that brainstorming session and set expectations. And finally, having those firm deadlines to hold members accountable. So to review, establish the group, the purpose, identify goals, get organized, and learn to collaborate. So now that we've talked about these steps, let's move on to some of the benefits of a COP. Um, what do you guys think? What are some benefits of a COP? Yeah, what do you think everyone? And just in case you're here a little bit late, COP is community of practice. That's what we're talking about here today in our webinar. What do you think everybody? What are some benefits of a community of practice or a COP? Um, let's see, sharing strategies, sharing in general, looks like a lot of people are saying. Let's see. Um, it helps us to brush up our professional development or our teaching skills and abilities. Alfredo says it helps us to work together. You can share different ideas. That's from the American Corner in Djibouti. Hi, American Corner. Um, let's see, you can exchange resources from BI. Great. Yeah. Um, professional development, efficiency, helping each other to solve problems from Coco. Um, it's good for brainstorming, says Bhaktigul. So wonderful, wonderful responses, everybody. Yeah, thank you. I saw quite a few really great ones. I really like move us forward, right? So we're working together as a group to move our teaching practices and our teaching skills forward um, collectively as a group. So I'm going to share six different benefits and some of the resources behind them. The first benefit to participating in a COP is to develop meaningful and professional relationships in a specific and personalized setting. Being a part of a community is being something bigger than yourself. You're part of this new group identity. As you establish mutual trust among members, you're able to provide a more meaningful collaborative environment and engage in a more personalized and specific conversation. This is a picture of a community of practice I worked with in Laos, and I know some of our members are watching today, um, and I'll be talking about some of their experiences later when we get um, to more of the specific experiences of our own successes and challenges. So in the next slide, collaborate in a supportive environment. Um, a COP benefit is the collaboration in that supportive environment. So for example, everyone is trying something new in the classroom. So everyone can support each other through successes and failures. There will be challenges and you'll be able to talk about those challenges and come up with solutions in that personalized specific setting within your uh, COP. So Working in a collaborative environment, you always can accomplish more together than you would individually. For example, the COP of the five new teachers, each teacher researched one strategy, but then had a shared knowledge base of five new strategies to choose from and try in the classroom. Moving on, sharing and discovering best practices is the third benefit to a COP which relates back to one of our essential elements, that shared knowledge. Remember, it's a sustainable group with a common goal, sharing knowledge. Your knowledge and skills grow as you collaborate and contribute to your COP. In a COP, you are consistently sharing and developing best practices as common resources to better your instruction in the classroom. Again, referring to our original example, about the essential elements as teachers prepare and research one article on increasing student participation. They only read one, but everyone shares gaining the knowledge of five new strategies. You don't have to read five articles, you just read one and share, and you get to try it out and decide what works best for you in your classroom. 
This is a group of COP access teachers from Burma, work, or Myanmar, working together, um, sharing their best practices of what works in their context. So moving on to the next slide, I want to talk about the support of sustainable changes. In a COP, you want to learn something new, um, and then you continually get to practice it and get that reflective feedback or support to make that change in your classroom. Participating in a COP will support your changes in teaching practice or approach to resource, research. And in our example, when the five new teachers meet every week to identify issues and share strategies to increase student participation by that continually, um, continual regular check-in and meetings, they're sustaining those changes in the classroom by continuing to discuss them and reflect on the success or challenge in that classroom. That's really great. And just a quick thing, um, we had a question from Sajida Bano who asked, can a community of practice lead to action research? And I think you pretty much just answered that question. Definitely can lead to that kind of thing and can lead to um, implementing and taking and, and looking into more depth on some uh, issues and strategies to address those issues in your classrooms. Definitely, and I love that they brought that up. And I'll talk a little bit about um, action research that one of my COPs worked with um, because they started with a small COP identifying that key issue. And as they continued to work on that key issue, they really um, had that confidence to talk about it and began action research in their classroom um, with that initial key issue that they reflected on. So yeah, thank you for bringing that up. I'll talk about that um, in just a few slides. Great, so let's go to the next benefit. The fifth benefit towards developing a COP um, is that it develops your leadership skills and builds confidence. Kind of like that comment in the past, being able to identify a key issue, which leads to that action research, which then could lead to a conference presentation. So you're really building your skills slowly through that sustainable support of a personalized setting in your COP. Um, when I started a COP in Laos, none of the members had yet to attend or present at a regional conference. So through our key issue brainstorming sessions, we decided to make that our goal for the year. Our COP member confidence increased once they developed a shared knowledge and a meaningful relationship and realized that they were the experts in the classroom and they had those best practices to share with others in the region. Approaching professional development with a positive attitude led the COP members to gain those leadership skills through consistent interaction within the group. So I also just want to reiterate again that you are the expert in your classroom and you can identify those issues to improve and make those changes, gaining in confidence. Looking at our sixth benefit, um, our sixth benefit of participating in a COP is to create a positive outlook towards professional development. As a COP member of the core group, um, everyone is contributing to that success of the group. So it's not just your individual successes in the classroom, but being able to support other teachers working together, trying and implementing new strategies or techniques in that classroom. Instead of sitting in a lecture, you're getting that instant feedback from your fears, which can be more practical for you as a teacher. What you are learning directly impacts your classroom. It's not someone telling you what you need to do. Um, you know what you need to do and you can make that change through your COP because again, you are that expert in your classroom. In my experience, I continually hear how intimidating professional development can be for educators and taking ownership of that PD can lessen the fear um, of PD or professional development through your COP. Um, here in this, this image here, gaining a positive outlook towards professional development, those are five of the COP members from Laos who had just presented for the first time at their um, regional conference through their action research after they had to, um, identified that key issue to work on. So, That's wonderful and congratulations to them. I wonder if any of them are here today. Nice to see you. Um, and one quick question from Irvin. Could a Facebook group or another social media group be considered a COP? 
It could be. Um, that's one way that we communicated. Um, for example, the American English for Educators page would have a Facebook group that wouldn't be a COP. To be a COP, you would need to have an identified sustainable group and you're working towards that common goal sharing knowledge. So you can choose that communication tool if you want to use Facebook mes Messenger once you've identified the group and purpose. Thank you. Great. Yeah, so let's go on to um, review quickly the six benefits of a COP. So again, developing meaningful and professional relationships in a specific and personalized setting, collaborating in a supportive environment, share and discover best practices, support sustainable changes, and gaining a positive outlook towards professional development. So now that we've looked at the steps to developing a COP and a few of the benefits, I have another question in the next slide here. How could participating in a COP help you? All right, great question. So we examined a lot of the benefits, um, the general benefits, but think about yourself personally here and think about ways that maybe participating in a COP could benefit you, could help you with your teaching practice or with your professional skills. What do you think? How could this be something beneficial for you? How could this participating in a COP help you? Um, let's see, you could learn a lot from other people, um, gain new ideas from others, build confidence. Paul says you could improve your research work, great idea. Benjamin says you could learn new teaching strategies. Um, another person said we can feel more confident in our teaching. Um, Kangurzul says that you could get a positive, get positive feedback from colleagues. Um, you might be able to discuss difficult topics, Alina says, which is a great um, thought. And you can better your own practice from Laura. So wonderful, thanks for those great responses, everybody. Yeah, thank you for your responses. I really agree with a lot of what I'm reading here. Um, personally, for me, of having participated in a COP, I think um, my greatest benefit is developing those meaningful and professional relationships in that personal setting. Once you build that relationship with someone, you're able to continually go to them for reflective feedback or support. Um, and with that, I want to continue and share a few personal experiences of a COP. So I've been a member of a few COPs, and I want to share some success stories, activities, and projects that have been conducted by a few of the members. Um, here in this photo is a COP that I developed in Laos, um, and you can see the group here. This was our initial brainstorming session where we were researching and brainstorming um, what we wanted to focus on for those key issues to establish that common goal. We decided that we wanted to present at a regional conference and some members presented together, some gave a poster presentation to prepare for that regional conference throughout the year. Um, we prepared similarly to the example of those five teachers selecting one area of improvement in their classroom. However, in our group, we chose to choose different issues rather than the same issues. And as a COP, you can decide what's best for your group. With our group identifying different issues, we had a larger base of shared knowledge, one of those three essential elements among the variety of issues. Our biggest challenge was keeping each other accountable because we all get so busy, especially with teaching and preparing for classes and grading. So we consistently used social media to check in and continue uh, or to encourage everyone to complete their work. Um, I'm reading some really great responses. What challenges might you face when forming a COP? For my COP in Laos, one of my members decided to integrate role play activities into her classroom. Her greatest challenge was the confidence to try something new in the classroom, but wasn't sure how to go about it. So she had researched and read about role play and the best practices. And once she successfully integrated role play in her classroom, she was able to share her experience with other COP members to do the same. She highlighted what went well and what she would do differently. Developing a meaningful relationship among COP members 
will help you get the support needed when implementing new and challenging activities in your classroom. So again, what challenges might you face when forming a sustainable COP? Great question. What are some challenges? Um, let's see, well, Adam brings up an interesting point. So maybe um, the question here kind of represents a little bit of a challenge. Um, what are the rules? Who is responsible for the daily routines? So I think as Mari was mentioning earlier, those are all really important things to um, bring up at the outset of creating and forming your COP so that you can make sure that there are clear expectations, that there are people in the leadership roles and in other types of roles, because um, that could be a challenge. If, if people aren't sure what they're supposed to do and what their role is, that could really quickly lead to a breakdown in the COP. So that's a great idea. Um, Vivian says maybe the members don't have enough time. So maybe you need to um, make sure that you establish those types of expectations as well. Let's see. It might be a challenge to find people with similar interests to discuss, says Cesar. Um, let's see. Maybe inconsistent attendance in meetings. So maybe there needs to be some motivation for participants to join. I think food is usually a good one. Um, Maybe the diversity of COP members might be a little bit of a challenge and there are going to have to be some, stra some strategies put in place to make sure that um, you can overcome that. Um, so yeah, those are some great ideas, yeah. everybody. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, thank you. Those are really great. Um, I think for our COP, they were uh, motivated because they had that conference deadline. So they knew that they were planning to prepare for a conference for the first time, sharing their um, action research. And so I think that motivated them enough. But yes, I do think that time can be a challenge and especially um, as the school year continues. And so in that initial orientation meeting, deciding how often you can realistically meet. Maybe once a week is too often. Maybe you want to meet every other week or once a month um, so that you're able to have the time to accomplish your um, goals to bring to each meeting. Um, so, <clears throat> also, I think with our COP, they really were gaining in confidence. That was a challenge at first. Um, we would practice together for their presentation that they would present at, and then they would find some willing colleagues or teachers and even some students where they could prepare and practice their presentation in front of. And so we practiced those presentation skills many times before presenting at a conference. Um, our COP has participated in many different activities throughout the years, and I'm gonna share a few different highlights to get you thinking of other possible goals you can incorporate into your own COP. So we talked about integrating new strategies, one new teaching practice, someone had mentioned action research. I'm gonna share a few activities in this next slide um, of what we participated. So of course, we talked about that introductory COP orientation. And in our COP orientation, we established that purpose, identified goals, and developed a timeline, um, as well as set expectations to hold us all accountable. Um, so if we want to click forward, I think there's some animations here. We participated in grant writing and mentorship projects. We conducted action research in our classrooms as it related to each member's key issue. Um, after the regional conference, our COP members began to mentor new teachers, sharing those best practices that they had learned. So we had a group of six and everyone identified their own key issue, but then throughout the year, they had six new strategies of six different teaching practices to share with new teachers at their school. So they began mentoring new teachers. We participated in a lot of online discussions and um, a lot of reflective conversations online. We used a lot of WhatsApp and Facebook Messenger. And then also we conducted co-teaching workshops and trainings. So after that regional presentation, the COP members worked together to conduct a training for other teachers in their province or in their city um, or in the district. And finally, of course, they pre presented at a regional conference. For some COP members, maybe just participating or attending a conference would be the first goal. Um, we were successful because of our clear communication guidelines that held each other accountable 
um, through that first COP introductory um, orientation. So these are all examples of possibilities that you could choose to do in your own COP, dependent on your COP goals for the year. You might want to choose one or two that best appeal to your core group, and it's crucial to have that introductory orientation as it begins to build that rapport among members and you establish the goals for the year. So in the next slide, I want to share a few of the COP remarks um, on this final slide. Again, you can see us in Kham Tisal, Cambodia, uh, Phnom Penh after that first presentation and some of their responses from participating in a COP. Um, I'm finally able or I'm finally enjoying teaching English because of the wonderful people I've met along the way, students and colleagues in rural areas. And I really liked that quote because as the teachers began to gain in confidence, they were confident to share the skills they were learning with other teachers in other areas in their country. Um, also, action research modules have rekindled my passion for research when I was busy teaching. The research I'm conducting is not too complicated either, it's manageable. And so through that developed timeline, we were able to make manageable um, and reasonable steps towards progress. So looking at our next slide, we had a reflective day to share their experiences of what they um, did and how they felt in that COP. And I really liked some of their uh, remarks here. The COP improves my teaching, inspires us, enhances our professional skills, and brings us together. When teaching gets difficult, it's important to take that time to stop and reflect on the positive community that COPs build to bring teachers together and integrate that reflection process in your timeline. Whether you do that face-to-face -face or online, it's still important to remember to share that reflective experience. Finally, some teachers may um, collaborate best online or not be able to meet face to face. So looking at this next slide here, I have two comments from COP participants who um, met online. So that first comment, online collaboration allows me to connect with others as well as a chance to see other people's ideas. Um, and so when you are communicating online, those messages, right, stay there and they build up. So you're able to go back and reflect and see other people's ideas, not just your own continually. And the last comment there, um, online or collaborating online gave us unlimited opportunities to collaborate with other COP members. Moreover, every member can read one another's feedback or responses, so it's easy to share ideas. So, whether you're meeting face-to-face -face or online or both, you can set your COP to be a success by teachers working together. So in recap, during this webinar today, or my final question um, before we review, who is someone you would like to work with in a COP? Yeah, what do you think everybody? Who would you like to work with in a COP? Maybe um, the type of person, or maybe even a specific individual. Um, who would you like to work with in a COP? I would definitely like to work with other teachers that are around me, my colleagues. Let's see, Vivian says experienced teachers. Jan says people who can inspire me, that's great. Maybe it would be nice for experienced teachers to work with new teachers, and new teachers to work with experienced teachers. New teachers can get a lot of wisdom and experience and ideas from experienced teachers and, and experienced teachers can learn about all that new energy and excitement that new teachers often have and really creative and exciting new ideas. Let's see, friends from grad school, from Ellen. I would like to work with other teachers in my town from Zara. Like-minded teachers who are and resourceful teachers from Coet. So wonderful, a lot of people have some really nice ideas here, thanks. Yeah, those are great ideas. And I hope with um, ending this webinar here that you do take those ideas and you do have some people in mind that you maybe want to message or contact and tell them about this and get started. Um, or maybe you have that purpose already um, with a core group. So you're able to, again, 
um, find that sustainable group with a common goal and shared knowledge to have a successful COP. Um, so I think that we were able to accomplish some of those goals we had today. We defined a COP and outlined those identifying characteristics. We shared those steps to developing a sustainable COP and examined some of the benefits of a COP. Um, and again, we shared experiences, successes, and challenges of a regional COP. Maybe if any of my COP members are listening, they can share some of their um, advice to other people here in the chat if they have any other questions. Um, but I looked, I, I really enjoyed talking with everyone today and I look forward to seeing pictures and sharing your ideas of COPs that you're able to develop in your context. So thank you, Kate. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you so much, Mari. We have some really nice comments from our participants as we're sharing the link for attendance. Let's see, Raquel says, nice comments. I consider this series a successful community of practice because we get great ideas from experts and colleagues from all over the world. Thank you. Thank you, Raquel. What a nice comment. Um, Karima wanted to mention that she agrees that it's a great idea to set a solid schedule with interesting topics to attract teachers to attend a COP, so that's great. MISPA says that they want to be part of a COP of English teachers working in China. We hope you'll do that and please share your experiences and success stories. Um, wonderful. So uh, yeah, thanks again, Mari, for your wonderful presentation and for helping us really um, think about the practical steps that we need to take to create sustainable um, professional networks in different contexts. So thank you so much. Thank you.